go around the table because there's a few new faces and names just to introduce ourselves. I'm Andy Guy, Chair of the IFCA. Steve Wright, Chief Fisheries Officer. Uh, Paul Wormsley, uh, incoming Chief Fisheries Officer. Stephen Bolt, uh, Chief Executive of the Association of IFCAs, representing the 10 English IFCAs. Uh, Mike Nellums, Council Member, resident on Tresco. Kate Sugar from Natural England. Uh, Amanda Martin, Chairman of the Council. Andrew Harry, uh, Senior Officer, Principal Accountant here at the Council. Robert Francis, MMO Representative. Nick Jenkins, MMO Appointee. Uh, Doug Holt, Fisheries Officer. Uh, David Milligan, uh, Senior Marine Officer, Penzance for the MMO. Uh, Tim Orsop, MMO Representative. Okay, thank you for that. So we'll start off with Agenda Item 1, Declarations of Interest. I've got a non-disclosable interest. My son is a fisherman. As Chairman, as a hobby fisherman. Uh, chairman, hobby fisherman. Commercial fisherman, Chairman. Commercial fisherman, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, item, item 6, I have received some remuneration okay. expenses for... Thank you. Um, agenda item two, to approve the minutes on the 2nd of June and the 21st of June. Are there any comments or can we clarify they're a true record? Proposed. Seconded. Seconded, Chairman. Those in favour? Thank you for that. Agenda item three, urgent items. There are a few, and I do apologise for the agenda. Steve was away, and there are... When it uh, was yeah, when it was printed. Agenda item seven and nine is for information only. Um, and agenda item 12, on the Association of IFCAs, we've got the Chief Executive of the Association of IFCAs, uh, Stephen Bolt, who's going to do a talk on it. So I'm bringing that in after 10, so that'll become 11, okay? Um, the last meeting, we thanked Steve for his time, and officially, I think this will be his last meeting, I hope. Um, I would like to welcome Paul Wormsley, our new Chief Fisheries Officer, who hope, well, will be starting sometime in December, but that's, there's an update to come on the official date. Um, I don't know if Steve wants to say a few words as it's his last meeting. Well, no, Chairman. Apart from the fact, just to underline the comment in the one of the minutes, which you've, you've just approved, said, said that there should be a, a one-month overlap uh, to bed the new incoming Chief Officer in, so to speak. <laughs> OK. So we'll move into part one, reports requiring a decision. Uh, we've got the budget monitoring report. And I'd like Andrew to take that, if there's any... Yes, apologies from Diana. Um, she's not available. She's in London today, so uh, I've stepped in in her place. Um, I don't really think there's any issues here with the budget monitoring. Um, and whilst we're looking at as if the spend's a little bit ahead of the profile budget, the profile budget isn't, isn't linear, um, and the forecast of outturn for the, for the year is, is spot on, really. So uh, there's no real issues on the, on the budget monitoring report. Are there any questions for members on it? Uh, Chairman, just got a comment on the um, on page 16 of the, uh, which is page two of the audit report, but page 16 in your pack, uh, halfway down risk management. Um, it's not quite true where it says, however, there is no evidence that risk has been formally assessed and considered by the IFCA board. That, that's in agenda item five. With, next. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we'll. We'll just go with the budget monitoring first, okay? Sorry. Sorry so are there any questions on the budget monitoring? No. Everyone happy with that? So we'll move on then to five, please, which is the oh, yeah. internal audit activity report, which I'll hand you over to Andrew Harry. Okay. Uh, a little bit of background on this. Um, the internal audit team come in every year, have done in the past, to do a small bodies return audit um, on behalf of the Audit Commission. Um, with the demise of that body, um, we've decided that 
we'll just continue the methodology uh, as if nothing's happened. So this recent uh, internal audit small bodies return produced by Cornwall Council's internal audit team, who were contracted by us to carry out that function, um, has reported as if the Audit Commission requirement was still in place and we're not really foreseeing any changes in this process. But that's the background behind this audit. Um, I think Steve's got an issue about one item. Um, the only thing really to report of, of any issues uh, from this one is the fact that the balance carry forward was understated due to um, an understatement of the income from the tagging project which was brought up by the, the uh, internal audit team and accepted by us. So um, that's the position on the paper. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, can I just <laughs> repeat what I started just now? The risk management, uh, um, it's not actually true that uh, there is no evidence that, well, it may, be, may have been seen that there was no evidence that risk had been formally assessed and considered because um, the risk assessment is seen twice a year by members. It's in the annual plan and the annual review every year. So that's not quite true what is actually in that particular paragraph. It, it is formally seen by members of this EFCA. Can we just amend that? Are members happy for that? I think it's the, the comment of the fact there's no evidence um, for the risk from the internal audit team, maybe that they didn't get to see that in the time they were here. Yeah. The fact they flagged it up means the next team will just confirm that. So, again, I don't think there's any real issue to worry about there. Okay. Then. Yeah. Any other questions? Proposer that there's a true record? Seconder? Second, Chairman. Those in favour? Thank you very much. Um, agenda item six, the Habitat Regulations Assessment. I'll hand you over to the Chief Fisheries Officer. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, apologies again for the draft versions, but neither of the, the, both the potting HRA and the netting HRA are finished yet. Um, the main reason, well, apologies, uh, re reason is because I only work two days a week and uh, it, something's always cropping up and getting in the way and weeks go by sometimes without having had time to address it. Um, the, the netting one is, which is the second one of the HRAs in front of you, is, um, is now much better than the potting one in the sense that the format is more uh, in line with the, the advice I recently had from the MMO. Um, and also I've tried to include some of the pressure uh, information which I received earlier from Natural England. Uh, they, they're both works in progress, uh, not, not finished as yet. The deadline is the end of this year. Um, hopefully they'll be finished and signed off, uh, quality control by Natural England before the end of the year, uh, but we won't be punished by DEFRA or the MMO for not finishing because there are, they are underway and we, we're not alone in not having them concluded in time. Uh, the reason I put it on part one, despite the fact that it's, it's, uh, they are unfinished HRAs, is because the Vice Chairman asked me to put it in part one because he wanted to um, uh, talk to you about some of the issues, I believe, in the HRA. Yes, if you remember, um, just an update from where we were at the last meeting, I, um, I pointed out that we had several of the sites, there's a map of the sites that we've done for the, um, both the videos and the stills, and there was some missing data. Um, during the summer, we've managed to cover the missing data except one site, which was number 19. Um, it's kind of out in the wilds, as you can see, and that one was just, well, for one reason or another, mainly weather. We just never got round to that one. Um, so the, the rest are there and in place. The geographical spread is pretty good, and the geographical spread actually covers the areas where there's the more delicate marine life more heavily. Um, the western rocks and... Uh, west of Briar is probably less relevant because if anyone remembers the data logger 
um, photographs that I put up showing the storm of 2013, how it decimated the, uh, the, the, the data logger fixed photography place. Within six months, it had grown again because it was all anemones, and nearly everything out west is either encrusted in sponge or anemones. So if there was uh, that area, any damage that's mainly going to be storm rather than human activity would recover very quickly. Um, just again, this, this, some of the examples of um, repeat photography from 2013. You can see the sea fans in the top of the picture. And 2016, again, the same two suit same two sea fans exactly in the same place. Um, this was north of White Island, a pinnacle and a slightly wider angle view in 2016. Newfoundland Point was on our list, um, which was a, a sunset coral site. And again, they probably increased, if, uh, if nothing else, there's a lot of budding going on there. So that's a sort of very healthy environment. North of Silly Rock, this one's changed slightly, but there's still the marine life there because the, uh, the change has been that there's less anemones and more sponges in uh, three, four years on. S and this one was at Spanish Ledge where you can see there's an old telephone cable there. You can still see the anemones. And again, three years on, four years on, they, the anemones are still all there and in, in virtually exactly the same place. So as a summary, the end result is, is that we've managed to do video sites for base data, remembering that they're not repeats, they're there for base data. 14 have been completed. All have GPS and instructions of which way to go, and there is a pit on with a little boy in the rock and I've checked several of them this year, and they are still all there, for any future, any future use to actually work out to um, repeat that particular video. Still photography, the repeats were between 10 and 3 years apart. We've now done 20 sites that have completed. One site... I've put the information there as base data only because we didn't get to Fleming Ledge. So I've added that into the, the information I've given to Steve as a base data. Again, all have GPS and instructions for future repeats. Okay. Are there any members who would like to ask any questions on this? Kate? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to say thanks, thanks very much. That's really interesting, and um, it'll be great to see the whole sort of set of data once you've got it all collated. It looks, looks like a great amount of work. <laughs> um, were any, just out of interest, were any of the sites that you visited this time the same as the sites we visited for our dive survey, or are they all different? Uh, no. Um, I could give you a reason, but I think I'll probably do it after the meeting. <laughs> okay, any other questions? So, members happy to note the content, yeah? Thank you. Um, seven is in, in part two, so we'll move on to uh, the... F Sorry? To, uh, on, the, on the sort of agenda item in general, um, just wanted to sort of thank Steve for bringing it forward and noting that... Um, there are the HRAs in progress and it would be good to work out when we've got a start date for the new chief officer and when we know what the sort of staffing arrangements are. It would be really good for Natural England to know the timetable for finishing those off and because the process is that we're, we're required to give our formal advice on the finished documents. Um, so just good to know for sort of work planning purposes when that might be. But you, but you know that already. But just yeah. to, um, I mean, as soon as we hear from HR, yeah. we'll, we'll make Absolutely. sure you get a phone call. And, and really good that um, the paper notes that beyond the sort of active HRAs looking at potting and netting effects on reef, there is the sort of paper trail, audit trail for the other interactions, the green and the blue interactions, which are the interactions between sort of um, gear and features for the site that were noted as not thought to be risky or damaging, but you still need to sort of, as an IFCO, need to have that audit trail to say we've looked at them and agree that they're not damaging and it's all been thought about. So it's good to see that that's in progress as well. So thanks for that. 
Yeah, thank you, Jim. Could I just add to that that um, the, the, the list of sites that Tim showed on the screen, I'm actually in the process of putting this together. Um, well, it's not, I another thing that's not finished, but it's in progress uh, for each of the sites which are indicated on the chart uh, and the, the list of the species in each site. And what I will do is to take the still photography that Tim's provided from each site and add it to these particular sections. So that that's, that's, will, will be done um, to accompany the HRAs, both of them, the netting and the potting. Uh, on the, the final uh, piece that, uh, that Kate mentioned just then about the audit trail, I've actually almost finished that. Uh, it's for the green and blue activities um, that feature and gear interaction activities which are not occurring in Scilly. Um, and I'd forgotten all about it, I must admit, until Kate reminded me about well, a few weeks ago. Um, because we, we don't have drift netting, for instance, or crab tiling, and the various things on the, on the list that, that are not done here, and I just didn't do anything about them. But um, I, think it, I think Katie's absolutely right. It's, it's, it's right and proper to be able to show a kind of audit trail that at least it's been assessed and looked at, even though they're not uh, occurring in Scilly. So, yes, Kate, thanks for that. Uh, it is underway. Right, so we shall move on to agenda item eight, the amendment to the fishing gear permit. I'll hand you over to Steve. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. This is not um, amendment to the bylaw. This is amendment to one section of the bylaw, which uh, is, I explained in, in 1.4, at the bottom of uh, page 69 on your, on your list. Um, and the, 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 the relevant word there is may on that first line. In accordance with the procedure outlined in paragraph 26, the authority may attach an additional requirement to a permit that prohibits a permit holder, etc., etc. Uh, in other words, they have to have a, a device called an inshore monitoring system attached. Now, um, the rest of the report is basically, um, actually, it ties in rather well because um, in, the, in the bylaw, uh, once three years is up, uh, in 1.5, the bottom part of that, this is the advice I got from the MMO's legal team, the act of adding a requirement for IVMS, either to the permit or the bylaw, would satisfy the requirement to review within three years. Well, the review is due in March next year. So it, it really links in those two together. Now, m members may wish to impose that requirement in other words there's only one it only by the way for information it only affects one vessel in Scilly and that's a, a, an otter trawler um, SC3 uh, Suena 3 it is the only um, it's the only permitted uh, boat that can fish inside the two small sections of the, the uh, European marine site uh, and he's got a permit uh, and it's reviewed it's renewed each year and the next renewal is due at the end of March next year. Now, uh, I'll put it to members whether you want to consider adding the, the requirement to have an IVMS, that's the first part of the, of the report, uh, to that particular permit. You don't have to, uh, because as you see in the bylaw, it says it may, you may put it in if you want to. At the moment, I can tell you that we monitor the, the movement of that particular vessel using AIS, now, AIS is, is open to the public, it's not uh, encrypted, um, and um, it might be difficult if it came to a prosecution, for instance, because he wasn't in that, those particular zones, but as trade elsewhere, it might be difficult to use because it's not uh, technically uh, sound enough. Uh, so that's the first issue for members to consider, whether they want to impose that requirement or whether they're quite happy for the moment or look at it at the next meeting, which would still be in time for the review at the end of March next year. The second part of the, of the report is, 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 rather, uh, is about whether you want to apply it to all the uh, small vessels operating in Scilly. Now, um, I would add a bit of caution to that, uh, to that for the moment because I was at a meeting last week in St. Ives and uh, Dr. Stephen Bolt will, will certainly uh, back me up on this one. Um, 
the, this was discussed, the, the imposition of IVMS was discussed considerably uh, about applying it nationally. Uh, there is a, a possibility that a statutory instrument will be brought in. It's only a possibility at the moment. Um, but the costs are, uh, can 90% be covered by an EMFF grant? And uh, also, there was also an indication that the remaining 10% might be covered by uh, Seafish, for instance. I say may, because <coughs> none of this is actually written in, uh, in stone. Uh, the approximate cost in 1.10, top of page 71, when the two units, uh, which, are now, which have been in use in Scilly as a trial, uh, at that time the cost was around about £850 a vessel, and the mobile coverage, because they, they work on mobile phone, whereas AIS works on satellite, uh, would be estimated at uh, £120 an annum. Um, and the, it's estimated now each unit would now cost about £1,000. But what is not mentioned in that paragraph is the annual maintenance fee, which is around about, well, quoted about £350 a year on top of that. So, um, a quite hefty costs indeed. Uh, as I said, in 1.11, there's a possibility it may be available funding through EMFF. Um, <coughs> not quite sure where that would fit in if it became a statutory requirement, however, because I know under the flag regime, um, it, the, the, there was a bid in to get cover for IV, IVMS, uh, but we were told that we couldn't, we, we had to do it before it became mandatory uh, to, to qualify for the grant. So I'm not quite sure how that would work with EMFF. But um, inshore monitoring would be really useful for the IFCA uh, to track the positioning of permitted fishing vessels, not just local ones, but uh, ones that may come in from uh, the mainland as well. And built into the uh, system are things called, um, uh, what are they called, echo fences? I forgot what they're called. Um, which um, predetermined uh, coordinates include geo fences, that's right, they're in 1.7 of my report. Those geo fences, you could, you could put in the, the coordinates of the uh, Marine Conservation Zone subsites and the European Marine Site, and uh, that would give a warning to the IFCA and the MMO, come to that, if a vessel was actually fishing inside there. There are other benefits as well, such as man overboard uh, help, and also um, that you could also apply uh, a tag to fishing gear so that the owner would know if somebody else is lifting your gear, uh, which, is, which could be useful. I don't think it's done here, but it's a, a useful addition. So there are, really, there are, there are two parts uh, for members to consider. The first part really is to consider the, um, um, whether to, to make the imposition of the IVMS uh, part of the permit scheme. Stephen, let's say a few words. Yeah, can I, if I can back that up um, with a couple of extra bits that have come through. I mean, basically, big breakthrough um, in that three types of IVMS system have now been type approved here by the MMO, uh, part funded by the IFCAS and the association. And that means that they've, they've effectively approved gear. Um, there, is, uh, there are two, as you rightly point out, there's kind of two routes that it could be used. It could be done through bylaw process, in which case you'd have the requirement on a bylaw, but um, I think the majority of the IFCAs are in favour of having a national, um, a national statutory instrument which would require under 12s to have, uh, there may be a bottom limit, I don't know what that will be or the detail, I've done nationally. <clears throat> um, and then there's a, there's a big head of steam to get that funded through the MFF as you mentioned. Because it's in the control pot, the control pot funding, um, I don't think the problem you had with the flag is still a problem, so even if it was a statutory requirement, you could get cost. You could get the cost of the installation of the the, the, the gear. Um, uh, one of the one of the chief officers has written a briefing paper on on the potential use of IVMS across the piece. There's a there's a lot of um, appetite for that. Basically, there's a lot of there's, there's not a lot of information on the under 10 metre fleet across England. Uh, it's a big data hole. Um, with regard, so IVMS across the piece would give a great deal more information. So I think it's a watch this space. I'd be, I'd be quite surprised if it isn't coming by one route or another. But you're quite right as well. The, the MFF funding would be to put the stuff on the vessel. It wouldn't then cover the cost of the ongoing uh, requirements on it. So it's still fairly early days um, because it, it took best part of two years to get the 
uh, IVMS type specification through with the MMO project. But uh, it's, <coughs> and it's not just for MPA management, it would also give further information and, and, and plug a hole because at the moment on the inshore fleet, we're reliant quite heavily on sightings data as opposed to VMS data. So when you have effort on, <coughs> on round England, you've not got very much data on the inshore fleet. Yes, Chairman, there were also a couple of points made at the Chief Officers Group meeting. Uh, firstly, that it's very difficult to make a business case for putting an IVMS on boats that use static gear. It's okay on mobile gear, I can see the, the benefits for that. Uh, but, st but boats that just use static gear, what's the point really in having an IVMS? We don't need to know, uh, unless they, they are fishing illegally, of course. And the second one, uh, is at the end of the, the discussion at the uh, Chief Officers Group meeting, the advice is to await the outcome of a statutory instrument before imposing it on local vessels. That was a, a, a phrase that was made at the COG meeting. Um, so I think the second, my, the, the second part of my report about whether there was a taste in the committee for uh, imposing it on all inshore vessels before a, a statutory instrument is uh, imposed or whether to wait and see what happens with that. I think that's probably the best thing. Uh, but the, the first part, uh, it would be useful to know members' thoughts on whether we should uh, forget may but will in, that, um, in a, the permit. In other words, add it to the permit scheme. Have members got opinions? <laughs> Sorry, I think you go next. Sorry. Yeah, members have as a chairman. Um, unnecessary cost, I think. Uh, how often does the one permitted trawler go anywhere near the areas in question? I, did, I didn't quite catch it. The how often does he trawl in the area? Oh, um, well, I've been on Two board hours. and checked his um, um, plotter as well as watch it yeah. on AIS, and it, it's not that regular. It mostly, it's further north. Uh, mostly is. Yeah, that's what I un understood. So why impose costs on him for no reason, really? <laughs> so well, th yes, th but that's the point of discussing it now with him. <laughs> yeah. uh, and as, as for the rest of us, I mean, I just, you know, f forget the capital expenditure. The annual maintenance and the uh, mm. mobile fee would be about 3% of my gross or 5% of my net profit. So one pound in 20, I'm paying for some and it'll never be used either. That's, that's the other thing. There's nobody. You haven't got time to do what you're doing now. So you haven't got time to follow us on, AI, on whatever. Well, that's the point I made about the business case. Doug. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say it might be worth noting that um, we've been, or I've been approached by a, a local fisherman over here that has um, expressed interest in doing some trawling off his boat as well. So that could make a second one. He does have the gear he is ready to go with it, so it is something he's seriously considering next year. Um, and he won't be as big as the other boats, so his um, effort will be a lot closer in, inshore, than what um, the current vessel is. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Robert. Uh, I go along with um, previous comments um, about costs, Mr Chairman. I think the, the fact is if it's not broken, why fix it? If you get a problem, if the officers find that, you know, on the AIS they're spraying where they shouldn't be um, and it is going to be a problem for the IFCA, then you might have to consider imposing it. But until the statutory, yeah. um, you know, stuff is sorted out, I don't see the need to impose extra costs on him unnecessarily. So are members happy to leave it in the report which says may? impose are you happy um i think that that's the wording of the bylaw isn't it so yeah so i think that would stay as may impose anyway and i'm i think it's something we should keep considering especially if there's going to be more yeah. trawlers in the district i mean just to put the other side across i can see your point that if he's not trawling in the areas anyway and you know that and it's easy enough to keep an eye on one trawler at the mm. minute then that's fine but in terms of future proofing and and, and you know in terms of scrutiny from outside and in terms of having a trawler that's operating within a European marine site, I think the way things are going in the future, it's going to be much more common that this will be a requirement to have IVMS on board. And I can see there's definite advantages to 
you know, maybe not in this case if he's not fishing in those areas, but if you're having a, a trawler or other vessel operating inside a protected area and he's got specific areas that he's meant to be targeting, then, you know, it's good to just have that data so you know where he is going and, and you've got sort of a reliable source as opposed to you sort of sitting there watching AIS. Um, so so I would, I'd be in favour of not imposing it, but I'd be in favour of, of sort of supporting that, of having vessels that are trawling under this bylaw within the EMS having to use IVMS. Um, but I can see the arguments against, and I know that cost is an issue. Um, but I think in general, and the wider question of IVMS for vessels in general, then I think, yeah, cost is obviously a big issue. And I see the point about if it's for static gear, small vessel static gear, then what's the point of having IVMS so that you can track where they're going? So, but I would be interested to see the arguments for having IVMS on those smaller vessels. It's something that I'm not that familiar with. But I think in terms of the looking at it from the work you're doing on the HRA, one of the things that's, you know, we've got this really good evidence base from Tim of sort of habitats and what's down there and condition and photographs and everything. And then the other part of that is what is your fishing effort? Where is it targeted? And, you know, what, what evidence can you put in um, to the HRA from that point of view? So that's where stuff like IVMS is helpful sort of into the future, looking at the, you know, the audit trail for these sites and the fishing that's going on in them. Um, now and into the future, it's what's really great is when you can have a, a sort of good map of fishing effort where it's happening, overlay that with where your habit habitats are and where, what you're trying to protect, and then you've got a really clear picture of where your potential risks are and where you need to target your effort. And at the minute, I don't know whether you have that as much. I know you've got some maps in the HRAs, but so just I guess I'm in favour of the more information, the better, but it would have to be done in a way that it didn't sort of take all your costs away, <laughs> take all your profits away. Steve. Um, we have got that information as the chairman. Can you put your light on for the record? Sorry, sorry. Um, we have got that information, Mr. Chairman. The Chief Fisheries Officer has already inspected the vessel's plotter. And we only have one vessel at the moment anyway. Um, so we know what his tracks are and where he's going. So it's, it's documentary evidence. And um, I don't think there's, you know, Personally, I don't think there's any need to impose any more unless, unless there's a problem, um, you know, because you've, you've got that evidence. If we get other trawlers starting and we start finding there's a problem, well, it's a different matter, personally. Yes, Chairman, the, the reason for bringing this onto the agenda were twofold. One, because the uh, IVMS systems have now been approved by uh, the MMO and DEFRA, uh, we've been waiting two years for this to, to occur. And secondly, it coincides with the, uh, the uh, three-year review of the bylaw. And they both came together. So I thought, well, let's discuss it and see if, if, it is, if members have a, uh, have, an, uh, have a mind to uh, impose that particular uh, imposition. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever to say that the... the uh, uh, the, the individual who's now got the permit is breaking any bylaw or anything. I mean, he operates generally outside the EMS. So um, I think you may be... It, it's worth noting, though, that uh, you can review this at any time. As, as yeah. Robert said, if there is another trawler that uh, uh, wants to come in... By the way, if, if he does, then there, there will have to be another habitats regulation assessment done. Um, because that, the particular one that enables uh, SC3 to fish there applies to that vessel only. It, that, that was always made very plain. So if another one does wish to come along, then another habitats regulation assessment will have to be done beforehand. Uh, it's not, it won't be a massive exercise because most of it will be cut and pasted from the original one. Uh, but th there will be details on different vessel, different types of gear perhaps, and maybe even a different area. I don't know. I think he wants, the, I've heard that the one prospective trawler wants to work in the south east corner of the EMS. And that's an area that SC3 has never been near. He's always operated in the northwest corner of the uh, if, if at all, of the European Marine site. Uh, but if you remember the box, uh, it's cut off, the two corners are cut off, northwest and southeast. But he's never been in the southeast. I think from the gist of what we're getting around the table, we'll leave the report as is, and it's covered with the maybe, isn't it? Yeah. 
and if there is another trawl at a late date, we'll address that issue until the, anything comes up. Is members happy to leave it as it is, but note it? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to 10 now, Natural England, and I'll hand you over to Kate Sugar. Thank you. Um, so just an update from Natural England's point of view. Um, in terms of recent developments from Natural England, one thing to note is that we have a new team structure. We've got area teams now, and our area teams have defined what they call focus areas, um, which is where we're going to focus our um, delivery work. So just to note that Isles of Scilly is a focus area for the Devon, Cornwall and Isles of Scilly area team. Uh, what that means yet, yeah, it's not quite clear because it's a very new concept, but um, I think essentially it's natural English trying to think about how to um, distribute ever dwindling resources in terms of the work we've got to achieve over the whole area in the southwest. And I think it's a positive thing that Isles of Scilly has been identified as a focus area because it means that it's being looked at rather than ignored. So, um, but yeah, I, I can update you as and when there's anything actually anything to say on that. Um, in terms of monitoring, we had a couple of projects over the summer, um, both looking at seagrass. We had the annual dive survey again, which was completed in July, August. And then we also had a larger drop-down video survey, which utilised the IFCA vessel, which I think Doug mentions in his report. Um, I won't get the results from that survey until early January, so, um, but I will keep the committee up when we do get the results. Um, and then the update on the SPA potential marine extension, which we've been talking about for a couple of years now. If you remember, there's been a couple of years of aerial survey of seabirds every summer. They've been doing overflights to see whether, particularly the European shag, are sort of what waters they're using. Um, but the agreement now is that there's enough data to go ahead and look at analysing that data to see if we can come up with a sensible site boundary to propose for an extension of the SPA. So that is the work that's ongoing at the minute. There's no more survey, it's just analysis of the data, um, which should happen over this winter. Um, and then just to note that we did submit a bid for internal funding to help support the IFCA tagging research because there was a proposal for a wider EMFF project again this year. Um, and we were successful. Um, so we got, I think it was eight grand, um, or it might have been seven. But that, there's a question as to what to do with that money now, <laughs> whether that wider project is going ahead, whether the IFCA needs this money for, to go towards sort of spiny lobster, lobster tagging work. So I guess that's something to take up with Steve and Paul and Doug, but just to note that that money is there and, and is in this year's budget, so it would need to be transferred across by April or by March next year, <coughs> if it was going to be. Any members' questions? But, yeah, just one, one quick question. On the, the, air, the digital aerial survey, has Natural England considered using drones? Now, the reason I say this is because some IFCAs are now actually considering the use of drones to, to, to um, monitor fishing activity. And uh, it, just, it just occurred to it reading your report. Um. So Natural England has, I think we do have some projects going ahead with drones. It's in its sort of early days. We haven't um, for this project because this was done using planes um, and survey from those and, that, and that's finished now. So there's no need to collect further data for that. So also I think there'd be a potential conflict between use of drones over breeding seabirds because this was a breeding seabird survey in the summer because there are definitely issues about... Um, disturbance of birds from drones and I know I think the RSPB and the National Trust might have banned the use of drones over their land so people sort of nationally are thinking about it and getting a bit more concerned potentially about the effects of, of drone usage. Yeah. Any other questions for Kate? Nick. Nick. Mr Chairman, um, the SPA, uh, the, I presume you're investigating extending it into water rather than land, what are the implications of that? Uh, so, if it happened, so the, the process is that now there's the project to look at coming up with a sensible boundary based on the data that we've got, um, which will be, I guess, some kind of ring around the islands. Um, and then it will have to go to consultation and then go through quite a long process before designation, if there is to be any more designation of European sites. 
Um, if it were to be designated, then um, from the point where it's proposed, the marine extension would have the same protection as the terrestrial um, bit of the SPA. So seabirds within that area would be um, protected. And in practical terms, it means that you'd have a similar exercise to what's been going on in European marine sites and what IFCAs have been doing um, in terms of fisheries, which is looking at the risks, looking at each gear type against the feature. Is there a risk? Is there an interaction? And if there is, does there need to be any management? So similar to the whole matrix approach and red, amber, green risks, a similar exercise would probably have to be undertaken for that marine area um, for the seabirds. So, so it's the same marine area as the SAC, most likely. Um, but the difference would be that it would be considering seabirds instead of looking at versus reef. You know, you'd be thinking about what are the interactions with seabirds instead. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's the optimistic way of looking at this. Are there any other questions for Kate? No? Thank you for your report, Kate. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce you all to Dr. Stephen Bolt, the Chief Executive of the Association of IFCAS, and he's going to give a, a talk on I'm the association. I'm just going to give an update on the association. And more. So I'll hand um, you over to Stephen. Thank, thank you. you. Um, good to be back here. It's two and a half years since I last came to a committee meeting here. I think it was March, whenever. Um, so it's, it's good to be back. Um, five years in, the association's been going for five years, and uh, some of you may have noticed a few things have been happening this year, which has sort of uh, injected a bit of interest um, nationally. Uh, so I thought it was a good idea to write to all the committees, um, and we put a letter together which came out from John Lamb, which is the chairman of the association, uh, which is in your uh, agenda pack right at the end, page 103 which sets out the first five years of the association, if you like, uh, and is also, uh, I'm committed to um, having another round of going to all the IFCA committees. Um, I thought this one would be a good one to start with, partly because it would be good to meet the new incoming uh, chief officer. Good opportunity to get in there nice and early, you know. Um, <clears throat> but also, um, it's always nice to come back to the Isles of Scilly, so I'm, I'm never slow to get over here if I possibly can. I thought I'd briefly, and I'm very happy to take questions at any time, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through. I thought I'd sort of kind of start locally, if you like. Um, a lot, lot of activity this year has been focused on completing the well-managed network of marine protected areas by the end of 2016. This was a commitment that was made uh, back in 2012 uh, to DEFRA. DEFRA set their deadlines and included um, all the European marine sites as well as Tranche 1 MCZs. And um, <clears throat> the association's been reporting quarterly to DEFRA, where I live practically, um, with regard to the, pro the, uh, the, the progress that's been made through the IFCAs. And um, I get information from all of the IFCAs on that and I put forward a report. And what I'm intending to do is at the end of 2016, when the vast majority of the bylaws will be in place, uh, I want to produce, I think most of you have seen the four yearly report the association produced. I've got spare copies if anybody wants to take one away, which was the sort of achievements of all the IFCAs in the first four years, going through a bit of national statistics and then case studies from each of the IFCAs. I got a case study from every one of the IFCAs. I thought I'd produce one of these, but actually I'd delivered on marine protected areas, so there'd be at least a double page spread for each IFCA. And I'm looking for Tim and co to give me some nice pictures and some really nice pictorial picture. And I think that Silas has got a particularly good story to tell with regard to where we've got to by 2016. It's been for the IFCAs on the whole, it's been quite a difficult process, and I was asked to estimate uh, the amount of the IFCA budget that's been taken up with the MPA process, and uh, it was straw polled right throughout all the IFCAs, and we came up with an answer of between a third and two-thirds of the entire IFCA budget has been taken up with this process. And uh, one of the things I say regularly to DEFRA and to anyone who listens is this is only the start of the process, it's not the end, we've got tranche two, tranche three, we've got additional SPAs, we've got changes to features or conservation advice. <clears throat> and then, of course, the IFCAs will tell me that actually putting in the designations and getting the management measures in place is only the start because then there's the enforcement and the, all the work, and that's where the IVMS starts to kick in. And certainly in other areas, um, it's going to be a huge step forward um, with regard to being able to measure inshore activity because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So 
that's where we are with that. Uh, along the way, the association has managed to get over a million pounds of DEFRA money um, to buy capital equipment, of which you're recipient of one of those bits, the drop-down camera. Uh, last year, we got 300,000 revenue to assist with the appropriate assessments to finish them off in time, and I'm currently negotiating a further 200,000 across the IFCAs um, this year. Uh, which, in, interestingly, probably will cover a national post to collate all the information and quality control across the 10 IFCAs. So that's the sort of what's going on on the ground. But against that backdrop, um, about two years ago, uh, DEFRA asked the MMO and IFCAs to look at joint working. Every four years, DEFRA does a report to Parliament. Secretary of State does a report to Parliament on the conduct and, and operations of the IFCAs. And there were effectively two recommendations one which doesn't apply, I think, to this IFCA was that some of the committees were just too big. And if you look at the back page of this report, you'll see that some of the IFCAs have up to 15 funding authorities, and all of those funding authorities are on the committee, so the committees can be 30 plus. So one of the recommendations was to look at that. And the other one was to do joint working better, improve joint working between the MMO and IFCAs. So uh, that triggered effectively uh, a lot of work on joint intelligence rollout, which um, is part funded by the association, part funded by the MMO, and that's happening as we speak. So the IFCAs and the MMO are going to be jointly doing their intelligence sharing and their risk analysis when it comes to enforcement, etc. And that's going very well. They're also looking at joint accommodation where possible between the two organisations. Um, again, it's probably not relevant here. <clears throat> I don't think you're going to be jointly sharing accommodation. And then, uh, as part of that, the, the DEFRA kicked off a review of the marine function of its arm's length bodies, uh, but included the IFCAs within scope of that. And that, rec that, that recommended, after about uh, 18 months, a report went to the Executive Committee. And it basically said, five years into the IFCA MMO model, 2011, when it all came in, the system is working quite well. It's not broken. Um, there are fertile areas to look at, but we want to, you know, we, we still want to move forward. The joint working is one of those fertile areas. Looking at joint assets is another one. Um, but we were subject to, uh, we weren't necessarily as a marine function terribly resilient, particularly to things like financial shock. And that sort of brings me to the, the third point, really, which is <clears throat> one of the main tasks going forward for the association is to try and secure sustainable funding for the IFCAs. The Marine Act says the funding for the IFCAs should be defrayed to buy the funding authorities, um, uh, but at the inception of the IFCAs, as I'm sure you're all aware, DEFRA set aside new burdens funding, which was to recognise the additional work that the IFCAs had to do over and above the old sea fisheries committees. Uh, we got, uh, the association had quite a lot to do with it, we got an extension of new burdens from April 2015 to April 2016, and then following the last election, George Eustace committed new burdens funding until 2020, but that was prior to the referendum, so we are still hopeful that he will be good and uh, secure the three million that DEFRA put into the IFCAs annually, um, roughly speaking across the country, uh, the funding authorities put in 6 million and DEFRA put in 3 million, so it's roughly one third, two thirds. The Isles of Scilly is an outlier because <clears throat> it's the other way around. It's about 80 20 the other way, isn't it? So you, the, most of your funding comes from DEFRA's new burdens. And 2020 is not very far off, and it's not, you know, long term planning is absolutely vital. So, into the marine review, um, as part of the risk, we're flagging very hard that the IFCA model works because we have this relationship between central funding for things like the <coughs> areas and local funding for local fisheries matters, and that's how it should be in the Marine Act. Um, there's also then looking at the relationship between the MMO and IFCAs and how, you know, whether the IFCAs could take on monitoring beyond the six nautical mile to assist with the MMO. A lot of discussions like that. And then on top of that, you layer Brexit, and all of that then has to go through all the, uh, the post-referendum uh, machinations and DEFRA setting up large organisational structural changes so that they can look at um, how that will impact on fisheries and how that will impact on the whole of the landscape that we're actually working to. And what we're managing to do at the association is we've got a seat at the table. We try and make sure the IFCAs are not forgotten because um, 
we're not DEFRA group, we're not core funded by DEFRA, so we tend to get missed off all of the discussions which are saying how we're we going, where we're we going forward, and I'm able to get us to those tables. They're about to publish a 25-year environment plan, uh, DEFRA, or they're going, to, they're going to go out to consultation on a framework document um, with the, uh, to be minded to publish the actual final document sometime next year. They'd got it all ready prior to Brexit, um, and we're about to go to consultation when Brexit, uh, the referendum happened, and they had to pull it because it's, a lot of it was based on European targets, and now it's going to be based on international targets and UK targets. Uh, marine protected areas are all part of uh, uh, international targets, and something that's in the letter that I sent out is it's quite clear from a regulator's point of view that nothing has changed on the ground with all the legislation, all of the stuff that was in, po in place before the referendum is still in place after, and I've dealt with that in the letter. But of course it does change things. It means that we, don't, we have less certainty as to the future. We don't, fisheries is, is high on the agenda of, of uh, Brexit in terms of negotiations with Europe, and it's going to be fascinating. From a regulatory point of view, I take the stance that um, we don't have a view specifically whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, we are regulators. Our job is to deliver UK and local fisheries policy. We do have a role, this is my belief, um, we do have a role if as local implementers, if our stakeholders are telling us things, then we can feed that into the process. That's different from lobbying. I'm not lobbying for one or the other, but if the stakeholders committees like this or you get stakeholders, then I can feed that into the thing. If they say this or that, then I can feed that into the process. And I sit on the 25-year environment plan steering group, and I sit on the marine review steering group, and I've managed to get us a seat at the table where previously we have not had that seat, um, which is really good. Um, I'm very pleased that we are there, but I'm, I'm constantly having to keep us there because they don't quite know how to, DEFRA and government don't quite know how to handle the IFCAs because we're local and we're standalone committees. Um, I represent, I don't dictate, so I don't, I don't uh, agree a policy which I then impose on you guys. You are standalone, mostly joint committees, but in this case a committee because you're not joint. Um, so that's where we are and that's where we kind of got to. Um, but moving forward, I think possibly you know, top of my list is to secure sustainable funding into the future. And if the model changes and we end up doing a slightly different role, then you've got to look at the funding model to see how that fits in with um, what we do. But I, I am flagging as a significant risk that if for any reason the new burdens funding went, then the current IFCA model couldn't continue in its current form. And I think this IFCA is, it would be particularly vulnerable to that. You'd be really hard pressed if you suddenly lost your new burdens. As I said, we've hopefully got it extended to 2020, although a minister's commitment pre-referendum pre isn't, isn't gospel. It's not like a check. Um, but there's no question at the moment. Um, we are incredibly, we're considered to be incredibly cost effective can do organizations. Uh, if I say that by the end of 2016, across the IFCAs, we will have roughly 40 new bylaws uh, put in place to manage the well protected managed network, of which you've got two. Um, and that compares, you know, across the piece, that's, that's the biggest piece of single work on the inshore on the inshore. MMO have got one going in, I think, um, and work with us closely where there are straddling sites. So uh, I, I'm also here to say that I think a lot of the um, IFCAs in their annual reports, etc., undersell how much value they give to me and the association when we're in that national forum. When I go to the chief officers group or the chief officers come to the association, it's that information that I take to the seat when I'm talking to ministers or top um, top DEFRA officials. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions on any of that, um, and I'm looking forward to producing something on MPAs, because the, the story of marine protected areas, I mean, I've been in marine conservation for 30, 40 years, and we've gone from one or two marine protected areas to 100 plus in a very, very short period of time, and I know some of the environmental NGOs are frustrated by the slow, slow pace of change, but to me it's like, uh, it's frighteningly quick. Um, we've gone to a really, we've gone to, to a next level, and I want to actually celebrate that, that we've done it. And if the IFCAs can do that in a, in a way that is balanced and not um, 
draconian or whatever, then we, we've got a really good story to tell and to sell. Um, and I want to make sure the IFCAs are seen and heard. Uh, and, and the model is being looked at, the model of IFCAs is being looked at across the piece and with, you know, by other European countries, etc., as being a really good example of how you could have local regulation but with a national perspective. And that's actually quite a challenge. Yes. Thank you for your update. Uh, Tim. One message I'd like to, uh, Stephen, and I know you, this is something that um, we've spoken about. We're small here, and obviously if there is going to be cuts, people look to the small ones to sort of amalgamate them with somewhere else. And it would be very good if the message of the way our unique environment here is different to the setup Anywhere, anywhere else, almost anywhere else in the country. Um, the relationship that we've got between the likes of myself that's into conservation and the fishermen has been instrumental in getting um, the MPAs and the management measures put in long before it was even agreed we could have MPAs. And I would like that sort of message not to get lost in translation and uh, I mean we, we've seen today that about the monitoring system for boats um, we act on a, a matter of trust and it works superbly well here such things wouldn't work elsewhere um, people have asked us to do that um, and I just want to make sure that, that we can continue because we have got a good thing here and it is a unique environment and it behaves differently. The environment behaves differently than, than on the mainland and um, without going into it in great detail, but I can talk to you and give you examples of how it is different. I've studied it inside. So one of the things, if you look at the statistics nationally on marine protected areas, it's very noticeable that of the 14 voluntary agreements across all the IFCAs, 11 are actually in the Isles of Scilly. Um, it doesn't, the voluntary mechanism doesn't work as well elsewhere, partly because you have fleets coming in from elsewhere uh, who very rarely will um, accept voluntary measures, so you have to go to a regulatory measure instead. But yeah, I take the point, and actually the, you know, your double page spread will, will be a really good opportunity to make those very points. I, I asked in a recent um, in a recent problem we had, it was brought up that possibly boats do come here from the mainland from time to time. So I took a little bit of time and did a bit, bit of straw poll with some of them and asked if we had a local agreement on something, what would your attitude be? And because we're stuck out here in the Atlantic, the attitude immediately was we wouldn't do anything to hack off the local guys where they've agreed something because we're vulnerable out here and we, we need a bit of assistance from time to time. So I, 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 at the moment, there's nothing that, that's sort of there to fear. No, I mean, I, I, I agree. And actually, um, uh, it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for... I mean, we, we have a statutory duty anyway to go through looking at voluntary measures before we start to put in regulatory measures anyway, although with European marine sites there's... Uh, potentially a requirement for regulatory measures not voluntary but the, the other advantage of voluntary measures if you put in voluntary measures and get everybody to agree to them and then you are forced down the line of regulatory action later on you're far more likely to get local support for that regulatory than if you imposed it in the first place um, and I'm not thinking I was a silly here I'm thinking in a much wider context if you get people to agree and if you almost trial a voluntary measure and if it doesn't work and if, they, if it won't self-police then you've got the backup stick, if you like, of saying, okay, we'll have to put in a, a bylaw because it's just not working. So I'm, I'm all for looking at those approaches where at all possible. But again, I think the special nature of the Isles of Scilly, you'll have an opportunity to put in a two-page spread um, in one of these reports, and that's a really good opportunity to do it. Yeah. Just for the record, Steve, I'd like to endorse everything the Vice Chair said for the record. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Nope. Right, so there's no part two, information only, no parts in part three. I will close the meeting at 2.30. Thank you all for attending.
Thank you. That's